Um, the title of this talk is How to Not Fail with Great Native, but actually during the preparation, um, I had to realize that it's more about the things that I wish I knew before I started with Great Native. So the background um, is I work for a small company in Vienna, the 25th floor. We build specialized web applications. We are not specialized in mobile stuff, actually. Uh, we were doing a lot of stuff with React in the last time. Um, we do some data warehousing, uh, actually, and Java development as well. But half a year ago, we started a mobile project um, that was um, where the goal was to deliver an application, a mobile application for both platforms that will behave real natively. So um, we could not use platforms like um, Ionic and PhoneGet that utilize a, a web view only. And it was an agile project. Most of our projects are done agile. Um, we had sprints of, of two weeks um, length. And we wanted to really show off the customer. So we started with um, try it hard. And actually, after two weeks, we delivered something, which was something good enough for two weeks. Um, after three months, uh, the application looked like that. It's for two weeks, that's a vacancy. How do you say check? Never mind, just uh, you can search for hotels and, and book your vacation. The, um, that application um, should handle just the, the booking of the hotels, so no, no flights and stuff. Okay, so that was the result. The talk is based heavily on, on the experiences that we made with, with building that. But let me take a step to the side, um, just to ask what, what, what's React Native, just some, some basic. <coughs> Oh, maybe before we go into that, um, how many of you do know React Native? Well, it's quite almost everybody. How many did use it in some way? Oh, quite a few. Nice. <laughs> so React Native basically is a JavaScript framework that utilizes React. So if you know React, it really, it really helps you with that. Um, and, and it enables you to build applications that do real native rendering. For, as I said before, for both platforms, Android and iOS. It, is, um, it was open source two years ago. Um, it's, it's built by Facebook. It's in production um, for three years now. So Facebook uh, guys used it for one year before they open sourced it. And uh, the main idea behind that is to learn once and write everywhere. So um, although they util utilize React, it's not about taking your um, React web application and just somehow uh, package it into a mobile application. The idea is to take the concepts that you learned about React and that, that you have um, and, and use those. But build a custom application because there are, there are complete different approaches for, for the mobile brand. Like you have completely different UI uh, specifications, are a different kind of interaction. So you can use uh, your code base uh, between the different mobile platforms, but the, the idea is not to use the, the web code base. If you um, just a slide, I, I copied that completely from, from the documentation. Um, so on, on, the, on the documentation of Red Native, there is a little bigger list um, about um, with applications that utilize React Native. Uh, most of them have some kind of blog uh, articles describing what, what happened there. So nice, nice tool. <laughs> what I just wanted to show is that, that there are big applications that use those. Although, although only the Facebook Ads Manager is, is using um, is built completely with React Native, the other ones use it just partly. So the, the cool thing is you can take a native application and you can um, still use some parts built with React Native. So there is no need to switch the whole application if you have if you already have one. Like with the Facebook application, it would, it would be basically impossible to, to rebuild that because it's quite it's quite huge. Um, okay, a short short um, introduction to what the difference is between React and React Native. Um, React uses the core of it is um, that it uses a virtual DOM. And it drives the, the real the browsers DOM with that. And React Native does something similar. It, it uses um, a virtual DOM as well. 
but it wraps uh, native components of the platforms with that. So there is, with a, with a packaged application, with a packaged application um, that consists in the, on, on, a, on a higher level um, of two threads. Come on, no, my machine froze up. Okay, so maybe the animations will come. There is a main thread that is responsible for, for the UI, um, for um, delivering a real 60 frames per second for, for quick and, and, and smooth UI and user interaction. And there is a background thread that is running a JavaScript interpreter where your React application will run. And the two, okay, uh, that sucks. <laughs> okay, so you will get some animations after when you already had everything. Oh, something <laughs> So, yeah, I said that there is some communication between the threads. That will suck. Oh, no. Yeah, it somehow it's stuck. Can you give me 20 seconds to just kill some processes? Maybe that will happen. I hope so now I started to freeze up half an hour. But I didn't want to let's try one. But it doesn't work probably. So probably I will go ahead and Pizza is ordered for 19 so it's uh, we have we have sufficient time. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, sorry for the inconvenience, guys. Is it okay to take it's, it's the first time uh, <laughs> twice. <laughs> It's like completely frozen. We try to close applications, but it gets stuck on it. Yeah. Yeah, it's responsive. Oh, oh animation! Yeah. Okay. Let's go to the best <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so what was, what was the point? Yes. <laughs> Actually, I had, I had the simulator running and, and, and exactly that thread in the browser and the background, and I'm, I'm highly suspicious that that was part of the problem. But it's not, it's not, it doesn't, it, it, it happened the first time, so it's not, uh, I, I didn't, I, I never saw that during development. So what was there before is that uh, those threads communicate asynchronously. Um, so the main thread can run really, really quickly with 60 frames per second, while the background JavaScript thread um, can be a little bit slower, can do some heavy lifting uh, com computations. And what this next slide shows, is that you can actually move the, the, the whole thing out of of the device and let your browser or uh, Node.js run the application and the communication is done via WebSocket standard. So this is highly useful for development um, because it, it gets you the possibility to um, um, debug stuff out of the of the device. So you can use the, your debugging tools on the on the browser for that. Um, okay, now nothing to read, okay, it's just, just to show the, the weight of these parts there. Um, I just copied the list of the components and the APIs on the other, from the other slide um, that are um, there out of the box with React Native and what I wanted to visualize is that there is a, a big part of shared components and APIs that you can use um, and the only small, small amount of, of platform specific. So, um, it's it. The point of it is that you is, is that you just build your application and, and build it out to the different platforms. There is not too much need to, to, to go into specifics. It will come, but um, it's 
pretty um, easy to, 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 to have a big um, shared code base. Uh, two of these APIs um, are uh, more important in, in my point of view. Um, those are animated and, and layout animation. What they are for is to, to manage animations that are driven by JavaScript because this communication between the threads is slow and is unreliable, uh, unreliable in terms of you can, you, can, you can't use it heavily. You can't use it 60 times per second. Um, so there are these components where you can describe animations in a declarative way and then the animation itself is handled on the device again in the main thread. That was pretty well as long as you don't have um, direct user interaction with that because with user interaction user sliding up and down and, and should still stay snappy. Um, um, and as, as soon as you have that and you want to do to, to some calculations with this you need to go over the bridge again because then you are uh, connecting again the, the um, events happening 60 times per second and JavaScript. And so it, that's a little problem there. But most of, of, of smooth transitions and animations can be handled again in the application. And talking about native components, um, there are those situations where just um, where the best solution is to go native. Um, and um, React Native makes that, I said, pretty easy. You still have um, to tackle the problem of some Objective-C or Swift or Android code. But um, just to wire up some, some native application, there are some, um, I didn't really um, look into that actually. I, I won't show it because it's, the, the presentation is about JavaScript. But it's like um, having some interfaces on the Objective-C part and then to wire it up from the JavaScript side, there is a, a, a method that you can import from React Native and you just give it the name. So this one expects some RTC Map Manager on the Objective C part and it just wires the stuff up. So, so then the, this module exports um, whatever this RTC Map does. And it's, it's, um, you can acquire that. Quick question. Uh, it's yes. uh, Objective C for Apple, right? Mm -hmm. And Java for Android. Yeah. And Swift also for Apple. They uh, switched uh, one and a half years, two years ago, some time ago. But all three are supported um, with this, this, this connection interfaces. The point is that that's more or less it. For the um, for the wiring up, of course, there's a little bit more code if you if you need to to have some some properties for your component, but it's it still is not that much. okay. So enough of the native part. Um, yeah, one big thing, styling, and that brings me um, to that what I wish I knew before. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so some of you have done that projects. So that's good news. There is no CSS, which on the other hand brings bad news. Because there is no CSS. <laughs> so it depends on, on, on how you look at it. The point is, um, that was a clear decision by Facebook to not implement CSS as it is. They had good reasons for that. Um, they, were, they were explained on the, um, on the first React JS conf two years ago when they presented it. I won't go into detail for that. But what they offer is kind of a basic um, styling. So there are things like for positioning, um, for layouting they use Flexbox or they provide a, a native implementation of, of Flexbox. It, it, it does a little bit less than, than the wet flex, flexbox, but still, um, I think that is sufficient enough and like fonts and colors and borders and stuff. But, um, well, knowing that before would um, be quite good. The picture there is like the, the design that we got for, for one part in the application, and it looks like nothing special. But this is it's quite a, a, a small resolution, but there is, there is a, right, a, a red um, um, line going through that price that, that fades from red to transparent, done with CSS gradients. And we thought like, yeah, sure, why not? And where actually it ended up like that, 
could have been done with, with there were a couple of, of ideas and ways, but it's like somehow and uh, yeah, that's uh, well good enough. <laughs> Finally, finally, it never got important enough to change that. But actually, um, yeah, I think it would be nice to, to just to know it before when doing the design. It would help with the planning. Um, another thing with, with, that, um, with the styling is um, you write React code, so you have components, you have JSX, so text. But there is no uh, class name like in React, so there are no CSS, no CSS classes. So all CSS is inlined um, using either um, some plain objects or um, um, modules. <coughs> but it's, the point is, all styling remains within JavaScript. Of course, you can structure your code, you can move, move those configurations into some modules and. and um, organized it in a way that is convenient for you. Um, that brings me to platform specific. It might be convenient to separate some um, layouts, for instance, uh, between Android and iOS. It can be done pretty easily. Um, there is, for one thing, um, you can do it during runtime. There's the platform uh, module that um, gives you either either a distinction uh, by, by the string or a selector. So the, this one here takes an object with an iOS and Android. <coughs> whatever is here with the, with the written text. So you can do that on, on during runtime or you can do it during uh, um, packaging time by adding uh, suffixes to the file names. So the .android JS and .iOS JS are used as if it were just the tab bar. So just, just import that. And the packager uh, makes the decision. Okay. Last words to um, the tooling and the basic yeah. <laughs> uh, So it comes with a command line. You just install it as a node package. Um, you initiate the project. Of course, that downloads a whole bunch of stuff. But nevertheless, and you just run it. If you have uh, Xcode on iOS or well, so for, for running that you will need either Xcode or Android Studio or, or Android SDK, not Android Studio. Of course, because, because it, it, it builds uh, uh, not only uh, um, the, um, the stuffs for your JavaScript code, but also the, the projects for um, building um, iOS or Android applications. There is a whole Xcode project uh, with all the files and configurations that comes with the IP inside the simulator. Uh, for the simulator, uh, for developing iOS projects, um, there is the simulator package with Xcode. Um, for running Xcode, you're going to need Mac or Stan. For Mac or Stan, you're going to need a Mac. Or you run it in a virtual machine, for which you're going to need to have a Mac to run it on. <laughs> um, Android devices, there is a whole, whole bunch of, of Android devices as virtual machines. You can just, just select those that you want. Uh, each one uh, uh, consumes some two gigabytes of space, so, so when you're short on, on hard disk, you probably not go for, for many of it. Okay, something completely different. Um, React brings a concept called hot reloading. That still applies here, which is actually the, the, the really good news. Uh, because hot reloading enables you to, to, to have much, much faster development cycles. So instead of, instead of recompiling the application, which might take several minutes, you can actually reload the JavaScript code uh, more or less just after you save the file. don't know how many of you use that with React, but it's, it's really it's so amazing. <laughs> that, that, that makes so much difference between waiting a couple of minutes, hundreds of times, and just having it there. Hello! 
On the simulator, you get some mean attitudes where you, for instance, start um, the box reloading or um, the, road, the, 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 the remote JavaScript debugging, which is exactly what I've shown before, uh, ejecting the JavaScript code to some other process that runs it, like the, the browser where you can um, get access to the, the console lock. Um, it comes with an inspector where you can inspect during runtime components, which might help. So you have the, the path within the virtual DOM and, and some, um, some properties, some style properties. Um, there is even a better possibility. There is the React Native debugger, um, which takes over instead of the browser. So um, it basically it's a package up from with lots for um, um, React debugging um, extensions where you can access where you can access it, it's really yeah, small resolution here. But nevertheless, those, those, uh, that is the, the virtual DOM. So you can access all your components, and um, that can be really helpful and stuff like searching by component. Um, um, debugging the Redux store if you use Redux console, of course. Yeah. So, what about um, doing it without a Mac for iOS? That's the official statement by Facebook. Um, few of these uh, um, requirements by Apple is not possible with, at least it is not possible with, with React Native as it is. But, but there is a pretty, pretty nice option. There is that export uh, um, client and Tool, actually, um, they are in a, in a uh, cooperation with Facebook, so it's not some some startup that will probably disappear in two weeks. And what they bring, it might, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it seems that they are a little bit more uh, to be taken seriously. Um, that comes with a with a really handy dandy desktop client where it's really. To, uh, I stole these um, uh, um, images about the Expo client. But the point is, there is a really, really nice um, desktop client. Just install that or download that, where you can actually manage projects. It's just say, hey, I want a new project that build, builds your, um, um, the files that you need. Only JavaScript files, no Xcode or uh, project or Android stuff. And you can run your applications directly on a device within a client that they provide, so you just download that from Play Store or, or App Store, and there is no need for building anything on your machine. But um, you are somehow locked in, of course, so you need that client to run your stuff. But it's a good quick start, actually. And um, yeah, if you have an iPhone, that's it, that's all you need for developing. Um, they bring much more, actually, that's, again, do not read that, or do, but it's just for visualizing one aspect, but that, that comes with an SDK that brings access to a lot of, of platform-specific APIs that are not supported by React Native itself, so you can you get access to notifications, that's the diagram, um, to, apps, uh, to the accelerometer, and to lots of others. It brings lots of interesting UI components, like audio component, video component, SVG, if you need um, a GL view, barcode scanner. So um, the SDK itself is really cool. And if you do want a standalone application, you are actually not that locked in, as I said, because there's the possibility um, either to use a remote building uh, um, that they provide. So this is really cool. You just you have to read the documentation. I just flow over that. But basically, there is a there is a client that you can install for it another and and you um, gives in some some credentials for signing of stuff that is needed. And 
just let them build it in the cloud somewhere and then you download your IPA or APK files and can submit that to the stores um, by yourself or um, you can just eject the project out of it. That builds up a whole code base with the Xcode project and Android um, um, Java project. So, I, I think it's cool. Um, yeah. Is it free? It is free. Good question. Good question. I didn't even think about that. It is free. Actually, everything there is free that I show. <laughs> it was kind of a uh, first fit. <coughs> Um, <laughs> and talking about Expo Day of um, another thing that, that um, excites me, um, that's the Sketch application, that's um, an, an online web application kind of code pen, um, JS fiddle, where you can just try out some React Native code online in a website with a preview, with drag and drop of components. Um, and with with a, a QR connection to your Expo app, so just you open your um, Expo app on the on the device, scan the QR code, and you have the app on your device. I think it's really cool for at least for testing purposes. Wouldn't develop a whole application. Okay, enough for Expo, but they are really cool. Um, just a word to the ecosystem that Create Native product provides. First of all, there is of course that part of React, the React um, ecosystem, that does not utilize um, the DOM. Everything can be used, so Redux, of course, um, Funk, whatever. Um, there are quite lots, a lot of components, um, single purpose components, and collections, and um, just in, in, within the native realm, uh, public with the JavaScript realm, and uh, components that come with native implementations as well that are installed pretty easily actually so it makes it quite convenient to install native components you still do not need to learn any um, handling of an, of an Xcode project to, to install a native component that's good okay. so the pitfalls our our pitfalls actually what we um, what we learn um, well, one of the biggest problems that we had and that we actually did not solve um, until now, still did not solve, is the navigation itself. So we tried um, several implementations. We had to deviate the code. Um, we have a custom implementation for iOS that uses some, some experimental navigation. We have an other one for Android that uses uh, completely other parts. We have to we had to decorate that um, um, still with, with with our application logic uh, because that's a good that's a good image. Um, that shows there is really a lot of things going on with the navigation. There are those those uh, context sensitive buttons over there um, to the right that change depending on on the route you are um, stuff comes in, in, in this area, um, um, this, this stack cards um, are moving without moving the blue stuff. Uh, there's always some touch bars below. And to get all those together and working together with the routing, um, where well, we did not find any any solution out of the box. And the solution that we ended with still um, is a little bit laggy, behind, behaves a little bit not so nice, much better than what you see here because this is a recording uh, from from my screen and the machine started to suck just like today, not that heavily mm -hmm. but um, most of the life is due to the state of my machine here but it still does uh, bring some light on the device itself mm -hmm. so as I said that there is um, also the part with the top part that's uh, been completely as a high level uh, a high order component um, with different implementations for Android and, and iOS because of different UI guidelines actually that was not a technical problem but it's just um, they look different on the system actually in iOS they should have there should be text not icons that was that was a real specific wish of the customer we had to do that um, 
So that's not that actually that is wrong. Um, this action button there, for instance, um, was also we found a component that does it well enough that the wire up to uh, bring it over there. Um, one big problem is this collapsing of the header. So when you scroll up, that uh, the <coughs> unnecessary um, header information just disappears. Or um, this change with some kind of, of summary. What is that? Because the focus is clearly um, over here on the content. Um, this is a really good good example for for the for the limits of React Native, actually, because there is, as far as I know, and we also at least we didn't find anything, and what we read on on, on the web is there is not really a good way to do it. Along with, with only within the JavaScript brand because of this this communication because um, that should that the transition should happen um, just as far as you scroll up so you have this constant communication from the main thread back to the JavaScript thread what's the position uh, of the communication back yeah shift it over there and it just it just lags behind so there is there is a native implementation. Um, that I have on the other side. This is this is another implementation in Ben JavaScript, I think. Yeah, it is. And um, I think Airbnb is is doing some um, development in this in this direction. But, well, I, I have the links on another slide. I'll come to that. Yeah, it is. So. Um, yeah, and the last the last thing was was this bottom this bottom text. Um, so there is there is a, a, a there is a directive. Oh, directive. Sorry, that's Angular speak. <laughs> <laughs> hey. uh, now it's off. <laughs> okay, now we know. Now we know. <laughs> um, there are components, but to have it work with with the navigation, we we just we just implemented it for us. It was the easier way. Mm -hmm. So the links I was taking, uh, talking about, um, Airbnb um, published uh, native navigation not long ago, I think two weeks ago, not sure. Um, that looks really nice, but it still is in, in kind of early beta mode. They are not using it themselves. For me, that's, that's somehow the limit. So as soon as it is in their application, yeah, then it's definitely production ready. There is the React navigation, uh, uh, JavaScript only implementation. There is um, the one by WIS. I still didn't look up what it means. There's a native variant of it. Um, I mean, collapsible navbar is the same. Okay. <coughs> Whatever. So there are kind of Couple of couple of components on the web floating around. Um, we were experimenting with that. A colleague of mine um, started, I think, somehow about the end of the last week, that week. So I, I didn't really have a chance to talk to him. <coughs> but what he what he uh, written me in short is that um, <coughs> it's we cannot use that for our project. So although it looks cool um, with all this. Um, implication that we have um, it, it doesn't work for us yet. So navigation is an issue actually. Hi. Hi. No problem. <laughs> Just a small one uh, for model views. If you use a native model view that seems to be um, kind of a single thing. That can be used only. There is only one instance that can be used. We had a situation. We had just several situations where we uh, needed a model view, um, and we ended up with uh, the second one displaying the contents of the first one. Um, so we had to we had to build the custom routing for the model. So there are two routings. It would have been nice just to know it in advance, like for planning. Um, 
interesting issue that, that we uh, came across with using third party components for a simple use case or well, so we thought uh, was the calendar. Um, by the way, this information, this concrete information is like half a year old. I hope and assume that uh, the, the situation is much better by now. But half a year ago, there was a couple of calendar of open source calendar implementations. Um, there was only one of them um, enabled some customization. So we thought like, well, let's let's go for that and you know that we can be quick. Um, and that worked quite well actually at the beginning, then uh, with uh, only a few additional requirements we ended in customization hell. Um, yeah, we, there was a solution with, with enough, enough effort. One problem that we just kind of have taken was the, in, in that concrete situation that, that one component had some problems with resizing so although the whole application could be switched to landscape mode easily and work well because of Flexbox design uh, layout which works really great, uh, we had to disable landscape um, just for that one guy. Um, yeah, funny thing, in the end we invested as much time as we, after it estimated, might take us to just write it completely by myself. But then it was all work, there was a calendar, everything had to move on. Um, after about, I think the first month um, inside the project, um, um, we got help by uh, Patrick Stapfer, who is a big, big flow guy. guy. Do you know Flo, by the way? Okay. Um, we did not use any kind of typing, but um, what the app was using, I didn't mention that before, um, the app used some public APIs um, by the customer that were not documented at that point and that were actually built not for a generic, uh, uh, as a generic API, but they were just built for their web page. So we just hooked in. Yeah? And, and took over their API, which behaved in a way that was sufficient for the web page. And um, that was, um, yeah, I made things from time to time a little bit more different, uh, difficult. Than, uh, however, the point is with Patrick, we, we brought typing in, so he took the time couple of days to type the whole thing through, especially the API, which was really a great thing because um, like that, that helped us really massively to see what kind of data will come in at certain points without having to somehow inspect that or debug stuff and just try out, ah, is that an integer, is that a string, why does it fuck up? <coughs> um, that was really, really helpful and it, it kind of helped us to document actually this, this uh, um, API. One thing that seems obvious, and we did have discussions about that just at the beginning, the first workshop for the application, there was, of course, we have to handle the situation when somehow the network breaks down, because it's a mobile device, of course, you will be in a situation with no network at all, you have to handle that, but then we just rushed through, delivered the first first thing after two weeks, and yeah, that was cool, and just built more and more and more, and um, and the API worked all the time, so somehow we forgot until there was a problem with the API, and then we realized, okay, um, we have to handle that situation, because when just loading stuff, and it doesn't come, then you cannot go on, um, um, to a, to a um, um, clean state with your application. The only thing that, that uh, remains for the user is to manually kill the process because that's not a web page, there is no reload button. Like, ah, it doesn't work, just reload that. Hmm. That's just not a possibility. So um, it, it, it was a really quick hack, just in, in case of an error, one button, try again. 
but that helped that help really, really, because it's, it's a dead end state and you cannot leave your user in that. It's not nice. Yeah. We had a couple of performance problems mm -hmm. while developing. Um, I've, mm -hmm. I've uh, uh, written here just uh, funny ones because there is a good page uh, in the documentation of React Native that goes through most cases that you might uh, come across. The first thing was when uh, we started developing using just the iOS simulator for reasons. It's just easier to focus on one thing. And then uh, we tried the Android on the simulator. It worked well. We hooked up a phone, an actual phone, um, tried it out, and it was really slow, like painfully slow. I was half a heart attack. Because, you know, like, uh, I don't know, four weeks of work, and nobody knows where to start. Um, yeah, it's the first thing on the, on the uh, documentation page. There is a development mode. On Android, you have to turn it off. <laughs> then it works. <laughs> Something pretty similar. Um, there is a, a, a slow animation flag in, in um, the iOS simulator that can be activated with a hotkey. I don't know which. But I did happen to activate it. Somehow. <laughs> it's like half a day fucking hell, what? Everything is so slow. Yeah, you can turn that off. Uh, oh, that's a good one, that's a good one. Um, we had reviews with the customer. Customer was in Germany, so we did the reviews online using uh, um, 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 Google Hangouts, which requires the browser. And somehow, um, always when we were um, in the review process, the application started to be somehow slow and not really responsive enough. Well, it turned out that um, when you have, um, when your application's uh, code runs in the browser tab and you switch to another tab, so you put that tab in the background, you just uh, decrease the execution priority dramatically of that thing. So it's like we slowed it down by ourselves. Um, by the, in, in the meantime, there is even a notification in the application by itself, by React Native, that says, oh, your browser is in the background. That will result in a poor performance. That's cool. It wasn't there then. Um, and on Android, when you have uh, heavy logging going on in background, that will slow it down massively as well. So you we, we really feel that. And to have heavy logging is pretty easy um, for development. Um, we use uh, a middleware that logs the Redux stock. So it goes like uh, for, for every change in the Redux store, there, there are massive logs. Um, yeah. That's an issue as well. So, um, yeah, but that and much, much more um, is in the documentation. The documentation is um, not fully written yet, yes, but <coughs> it does provide a lot of, lot of good information. So, the last but not least thing that we had, that we still have, the greatest and actually, to be honest, um, are upgrades. Um, they come quite, quite often. But the problem in here is that it's not just an upgrade of, an, of a node package. It is an upgrade of a node package, but there's more. Because when, when starting a project, you get, of course, all your node dependencies and stuff. That works great. But you get a lot of code um, that is checked out once. The whole Xcode project, the whole um, Android, Java, project with all configurations and stuff and these have to be upgraded um, separately these are not part of the of the node dependencies that, that you can upgrade just with some npm install so there is a custom app for that the native git upgrade module which uh, according to the documentation you just install that you run it you 
ends up in a big fuck up. Uh, conflict that comes from somewhere, and it will, yeah, it will look like that actually. This is on on the export uh, X code part. That's um, I think the the project configuration. So. That's what I meant. There's a lot of configuration files that are formatted in some way, like they're using some hash codes for things. Um, and there's a high chance that there will be conflicts because, for instance, if you want a custom icon for your application, you have to do that in the projects themselves. This is not the JavaScript part. The icon of the application is part of the application project. So you have to do it once in your Xcode project, for the Apple Store, once in the Android project, you end up with conflicts. Or, in that case, some integration with Hockey App or stuff. Whatever you change there will bring you um, into some kind of conflict. Mostly, this can be solved. Mostly, these conflicts can be solved in finite time. It might take you a day, it might take you five minutes. It depends. Uh, but, um, not necessarily. So we are currently in a situation um, that we cannot upgrade because there is actually a bug in this upgrade module that um, hangs on a, on a certain change within, within the Android package. Um, there is, for instance, this problem. We are actually on the version 40. It's the bad one. And we cannot upgrade to 43 because of that bug, and Forte has another bug that makes performance on Android slower. Um, although it, we didn't, um, um, so it, it, it's not that slow as it, not really readable, is it? But yeah, extreme lag, that's the point of it. Um, yeah, it's not that extreme in, in, in our situation. But, well, that's, stuff, stuff is developing. And so that's not that's not so so far um, at least to now. And um, I mentioned Hockey App before. So for deployment, there is of course you can just build your your application package and, and um, deploy that manually via the stores. But you can automate things and. There is the Hockey app, it's a really great thing, it, it, it has nothing to do with, with React Native actually, just for, it has something to do with better deploying of, of Android and, and iOS applications, but it's, it's great for, for better deployment, so register a bunch of your beta users, beta testers, they install the Hockey app on their devices and they get notified each time you publish a new beta version and can download it to their devices. It's pretty convenient. There is fast lane for complete automation. Mm -hmm. you, can, um, you can automate the whole process of um, signing and, and making snap and making screenshots for the store. So that's, that, that really is convenient. It takes some setup time, but it's also if you are planning to deploy often. And there is, there is the third possibility of deployment, namely to circumvent the app stores, Play Store, uh, and to push just your JavaScript application to the clients. So there are um, two cloud services for that. They, they do basically the same, the App Hub and Code Push. Um, Code Push is open source and is, is uh, built by Microsoft. You still need to use the, the Microsoft Cloud for that. And the idea is that the clients just just ask the code push server, hey, what, what version is the recent one? Oh, there's a new version. And they trigger an update. So you get your application once in the store, and from that point on, you can just uh, deliver new versions to all your clients, actually. So you have no, no separation in, in installation base. Um, and you are not dependent on Microsoft for that, because there is an open source implementation for the code push server itself, so you can host the whole infrastructure by yourself if you want. Well, oh, by the way, we have not used it yet, code push. Okay, we have a fast lane uh, uh, <coughs> running, and 
von der Aura weiter beurteilt. Ich bin schon zu dem Boden nach von der Aura. I hope it will because it sounds really, really cool. So I compiled a couple of slides um, with, with, with some with links for help. Well, first, first one, um, what I wanted to say was what was the situation half a year ago? What just the feeling that we had with, with the, um, the ecosystem last year um, was that Although there were many components open sourced and available to use, many of them were implemented for really just one single purpose in one single situation, uh, which, mean, which means that um, they were not really customizable. And uh, yeah, that, that made it difficult for us to, to integrate them. Because our needs were somehow always at least slightly different. Um, and actually, there are a lot of components and only a few of nice components, although this is highly personal opinion, okay, so you don't, don't quote me. <laughs> okay, now, for the beginning, um, that's something we did not do, I wish I we did, but we didn't, using a boilerplate uh, uh, starter app. There are a couple of wire now um, that seem promising, um, like there is Snowflake, that are only somehow the same that brings you an example application up and ready so one that has much more than welcome to react native press r to remote but this really um, um you have a redux store you have some kind of code organization for your stuff and like the most some some test uh, infrastructure comes with that so um it's it's all there and you just need to take it over and, and, and make it your application. And the last one is Ignite, that's a, that's a generator, actually. <coughs> While the other ones I think you have to check out and then use that code base. I'm not 100% sure about it, but I think they work that way. Uh, with Ignite um, you get some CLI and you can generate stuff inside your code. Component collections. There is native base. This is quite big. Brings lots of uh, components for both uh, platforms. There is quite nice collection at GS Coach, um, opinionated um, catalog. And what I said before, the Expo client comes with quite a big SDK. Then um, those are these native. Um, implementations of the navigation and interactable um, brings a couple of components that have <coughs> this, this one issue when the user interacts and you have you, you need some heavy animations for that it looks nice didn't try that out uh, there is a material UI implementation for iOS for Android of course mm -hmm. uh, the box so if you want your app to look material um, on both devices there is something um, and in case I, I just came across that but it, it, it looked somehow fun there is an app creator so for simple but um, nice designed applications there is the web service uh, where you can somehow drag and drop your application just uh, rudimentary style changes. Now I want that in a in kind of a red flavor. No blue is better. Uh, and you drop your all your stuff together and it wires it up somehow. Um, that of course brings the limits with, with um, such a creative thing. But um, if you have a really um, limited use case, a simple use case, it might be might be an interesting approach. Just click your application. Can you download it and customize it yourself? I have no idea.
<laughs> because that's so far from, from what we are doing. I just found I just thought that's such yeah, a fun thing. I try to feel, feel like that and it ends with for next features you have to pay thirty dollars and so well, on. It wouldn't be stupid, yeah. <laughs> Business. Yeah, that's it. It is it's I don't know uh, how they do their money. Okay, so last slide, React Native talks really, really good stories. And there is a an, an quite, quite uh, extensive list of everything React Native on GitHub, 20 pages of links. There is a lot of stuff to find there. A lot of useful stuff as well. So, the last slide that we've done it. So the last slide, because I have been asked that actually on Monday already. And I didn't think about what well, that might be interesting, but there was the specific question, would you use it again? Or would I use it again? Um, and my answer is a clear Yes, yeah. <laughs> I would. So although it does bring some limitations, it does have some some problems. It's it's not not so major, uh, uh, but it, it's still. Yeah, I I, I love it. It, it. it has a great developer de uh, experience. It enables me as a web web developer to quite quickly produce native applications. Yeah, that's great native is <laughs> Okay, but personal opinion. Okay. That's it. Um, if you have any questions, just feel free to ask. Two here. Uh, last question. Mm -hmm. What the reality about the sharing the components? Mm -hmm. There are the requirements and restrictions when you want to write a component that this is also for web creation and native application. Ha! Huh. Well, that, that, huh. it's, that's that's one. There's one limitation. If you so the question, if I if I understood it correctly, was what what is the limitation when you want to write a component that you can use both in a web application and in a mobile? Yeah. Uh, what? Um, the limit is that you cannot use any DOM. That's it. <laughs> so, because so you, it, it, it will be a component that, that does not have a UI. You can you can write middleware, logic, whatever. But um, for um, UI, you have with, with React. You write to the browser DOM. You use some a diff, a span, and EM, IMG, and and in the, in the mobile you have completely different uh, UI components. It's like uh, it's a, a view or a text component, image component. So, so you have to do some transformation of the native components, or how do you do? How do you uh, take a component uh, written for native? And use it in the web. In the web application. Well, the main idea is that you do not do that. <laughs> and not specifically the idea uh, behind the React Native, um, because because the UI requirements are so strictly different. Actually, so they encourage the developer to to really make a cut here and say, so when I am developing a website. I will concentrate and the, in, in the, the delivering a really good web experience. But when I do a mobile application, I do the same for mobile. The mobile uh, experience is is quite different because of all this quick interaction. For one, you have to structure your information differently because you have always only this limited space in the web. On a web application, you can have quite quite a lot of of, of screen space. Um, so they they've made a clean cut between those two products. So my thoughts about the shareability of components were completely wrong. Yes. 
<laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> no, but that's a good question. That was really a good question because that's that's the point of it. That you do not just package up your web application in, in a mobile device. Actually you can you can really good do that with, with uh, Ionic as well. They bring their own custom components or uh, mod components. Who's the Android right here? Um, name in, 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 in Angular for components. Yeah, never mind, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Yes? Uh, now you said that the browser has another thinking, but uh, on the stacked uh, slide and even on the pitfalls was problem with browser. So what, what role oh. the browser plays in uh, mm -hmm. React Native game? The, um, the browser plays a role during the development. It, not, it, it does not need to be a browser. It's just the idea that you check the JavaScript code out of, of your simulator or the uh, connected device. You can connect the device via USB. But there is no DOM, right? There is no DOM at all. Said... Yeah, the, the, browser, the browser just just works as a JavaScript uh, interface. So it, it doesn't render anything. It just runs runs the the application, which manages its virtual DOM, and all those components do on, on their render uh, method communicate via WebSocket with with the application running on the device or on the simulator. Okay, so yeah. it really is just the application logic, and the UI is separated on on wherever simulator or the device. Yeah. Can you shut some code? I can. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody asked. Except if my machine dies, okay? I'll try not to. IntelliJ, others use whatever. I use it for other projects as well. Not all the way now. Um, so it's JavaScript you are developing. It which, doesn't matter. Which dialect? Um? Which dialect of JavaScript? Yes, six. Yes, six. Um. So. Look, it's it's quite neatly organized. What what do you want to see? The components are totally different. You told us the components, right? Like the header. So here it's a good example. Um, <laughs> it's a little bit heavy to read because uh, a different uh, difficult problem. That's the header component. That's it's here, and that one um, imports. Uh, one of those. Okay. Never done it with such a resolution. <laughs> but it works. But I don't. I, I do not need to scale it up. Can you read that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there. This, this is an example for this animated view. All those animations. Of course, we, we utilize this, this animated component as good as we can. And, and here drops in either the iOS implementation that uses uh, navigation experiment or the machine freezes and yeah. No. 
directly within the components so we did not go for a, a, a separation like that's this this discussion going on for some time with react um, it started with jsx with separation of concerns now you cannot do your view with one within your uh, 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 controller and then they brought in some style and, oh you cannot do inline style but it, it works quite well for us. What, what we moved out was were some some stuff like typography, so some so to say constants. But basically, we try to have the component itself contain everything that it describes, it. and style is a part of the component. There was a question, yeah. Yeah. You, you said you can use CSS and you import some style sheets. So yeah. What, what was that? Good question. You can't use CSS. And what I import here is a uh, JavaScript. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> there is a component called StyleSheet, which is um, for that. And um, what we import, uh, I can see it here as well. Um, we have a theme module that defines theme stuff like colors. And uh, yeah, this typography, so headlines are always headlines. <coughs> so there is some kind of organization that you would find with CSS files because it's convenient for that. So common things are um, put up. And um, these things here, these are um, the attributes that are supported by, by the uh, components that will, will, will get that SS type. So it's used here. And like like here, it's like we address, we take this view and it gets um, that style to logo, which looks like ah, oh, then it. Where does that come from? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never mind. The point is, each component has a specific set of style attributes that are implemented with it. Because something like position is doesn't make sense and is not available for a text component. Position can be set to a view. You always use can be used for positioning and dimensioning of things. Text displays text. So text can get some attributes for font family and for color of the font. And the view can get something like a background color or a width or height. So, so the, the style attributes is not like some kind of an abstract language defining style for everything, but each component has its abilities, the guys decided to use um, the common names that are, that are known from, from the CSS realm, which I think does make quite sense, some sense. Most of them describe what they do anyway, like it's color, color is color. Um, and yes, so it does, does look similar to CSS. But it really is just, just a small set and it's, it's really, um, it's, it depends on the component that we'll get. Because you will get an error if you send some um, left or right uh, to a text component. That will result in, oh no, that property ain't supported. Big, big red, red screen. That's probably an interesting thing to, to, to say. Um, they encourage you to have no errors. So it's not like in the browser where you can get around with, with some, some 
a bad code or some non-compliant <coughs> code. As soon as something is not compliant, you get one big red screen with an error message. That comes immediately. So it's kind of a motivation to get it done. And it works! <laughs> yes, okay. Is that sufficient? Yeah. Did you have any needs for the native components, for the custom native components? Something that you know, something that you couldn't, couldn't build by yourself or just give it by your party? We do have such a need, that's the navigation, the whole navigation issue. Uh, but we uh, we have no no native developers and nobody of us is uh, really do learn. Um, does want to learn that. He certainly not. For reasons, yeah, it's okay to do that. But um, so we have we have no that's that's not a possibility for us to build them by ourselves. And uh, the pain the pain on the customer side is not big enough to just outsource that. And the third library third party libraries are not good enough. Okay, so that's something we just try to sit up actually. And like maybe in a couple of months something might cross the radar. But basically, um, the, the door is always open, so you are not working. Where are the limitations? When you've got this application, and where are the limitations for native components? Like, uh, like for example, when you want to utilize camera or mm -hmm. GPS. I see. So, um, React Native itself comes with, with quite a bunch of, of uh, APIs that it connects of, of the platforms. Um, the Expo library brings you some others. Basically, there is, as far as I know, not an inherent kind of, of, of limitation because you can always uh, program some code for your target platform that utilizes any, any low-level API and exposes that over to the JavaScript framework. So if you are willing to go that way, you can. The question is only um, if you find something that supports it. So, the, so if you have no native developers, the limit clearly is, uh, is what, what's available by third party and great native. So if, if you've got some, kind, uh, some sort of na native uh, coders, you can make everything. Yes. So you can wire up every uh, 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 controller or manager or however it is call, called in, in, in that domain. Um, you can you can wire that up and, and just connect to it from, from the JavaScript code. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Did you notice any gap between platforms, Android and iOS? Is iOS better supported or uh, faster running stuff? Or um, that's something that I cannot say in general, actually. So there are little problems here, there are little problems there, and you, I, I, I cannot weight them against each other. Each other. So. Um, like sometimes things just fuck up somewhere, but you get that on both platforms. It's not like only on here always, and that goes smoothly. No, definitely not. And um, one thing that that um, we got into was like um, fixing a bug that happened only on one platform resulted then in a bug on the other. What can ping pong, ping pong. Thing. So that that was that was that was annoying actually, but it's not one better than the other in my opinion. Not even with performance. Uh, no, not in general. Not not when you consider the performance tips from from the documentation. So like Android does have this problem with extensive logging, but well, when you turn that off, that's it. Uh, is those is it a, is the rendering of those styles uh, the same on both systems or is the same? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily. 
So, um, so it's the same like method have... like Internet Explorer and Chrome? It's nothing like Internet Explorer. So, <laughs> yes, good. That's okay. Um, that's an example. We have this component here just for the margin. That's uh, uh, the margin for the for the stack card, um, rendering the content, <laughs> the page you are um, And it's that's that's uh, generalized, but it's called with different values because this menu um, somehow gets not the same height on on the two platforms. Yes. But it's not it's nothing like Internet Explorer and, and, and other browsers. It's not like you it's it's not um real that some somewhere something just not implemented or supported. Okay? So those are just minor differences that yeah. Is there some kind of uh manifest generator like I, you use GPS you need GPS permissions and uh, you, you just import the module and you get it into the manifest file or I need to manage by myself that's a good question actually I expected to, to do that for, it, for itself but um, I don't know because this 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 will handle only the Android part mm -hmm. of course so you still have the same problem on on, on Xcode but when you when you so you have you have a package JSON and um, so when you include native components then those are in, the, the native parts are installed as well so I expect it to not only put in the native modules but to, to uh, alter the, the uh, config files as well okay. but it's, it's the only way that somehow makes sense for me might be different in, in, in reality. So you have to keep your package JSON clean because well, you will have to keep your package JSON clean always, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> it depends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like okay, don't don't help anybody. Yeah. That should move over to the dev <laughs> How is the support between uh, different versions of Android or different versions of iOS? Is there some problem with older versions of Android and if you run it, can you run it on Android 3 or just Android 5? And I have no, no, no real experience in, in, in this situation because we uh, decided on the recent versions. Um, but yeah, you can you can end up in inversion hell, of course, and device quite uh, some clustering, uh, uh, the opposite of clustering, of the fragmentation. Okay. So um, we did have there was um, testing was done by the customer just to spare us some time. Uh, they have, um, I don't even know. So there came just three ports in there on Android, it's such and such. Um, actually, we could reproduce the bugs that they sent us on our device. We were working just with one device. So that worked well, but I cannot say that it will always end so that there are no flaws. I don't know. I've not tried it in a really broad base and, and lots of versions. But I'm, I'm quite sure that that, that might be helpful you want to support something that you really support because just things change. Yeah. So okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. so, any more questions? Okay. Yeah. So I think I think we've done that. And as far as I'm informed, there is beer every day. Yeah. Yes. So please 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 give applause.